Thomas Miller joins me to discuss Oktoberfest and Hellas beer styles. This is Beersmith Podcast number 229. This is Beersmith Podcast number 229, and it's early January 2021. Thomas Miller joins me this week to discuss Oktoberfest and Hellas beer styles. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. Dot com. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. For more information, again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith Free Software a try. If you've not downloaded the new 3.1 update, grab it now as it includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, new add-ons, and much more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to Beersmith.com today. Again, that's Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Thomas Miller. Thomas has been part of the brewing industry since 1990. He has been widely published across a variety of print and internet media, serving America's craft beer scene, including Brew Pub and Brew Your Own Magazine. He published his first novel, An Oktoberfest Death, in 2020. It's great to have you. Thomas, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you today? A first-time guest on the show, and uh, we're happy to have you. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, Brad. Thank you very much. So uh, you've actually been working in, in writing about brewing for some time, and then I think you mentioned you, you took a little hiatus when we were discussing before the show. Yep, yep. This is, uh, you know, when it comes to talking about my my history, I, I hate to, like, take it way back in, in time, I suppose, but uh, my love for beer um, started, started in high school. And uh, that might not sound like such a great thing, knowing that we have a 21-year uh, age uh, uh, drinking requirement. But I studied German, and I had an opportunity uh, as a high school student to spend time in the uh, summer between my uh, sophomore and junior year uh, in central Germany. And oh, it was cool. during that time, yeah, it was during that time in central Germany that, that I kind of, for lack of a better description, learned about the beauty of beer um, firsthand. And while I enjoyed the opportunity to drink the beer, I also learned about presentation um, and flavor. And it was really that presentation and the flavor that, that when I came home to the United States, um, uh, carried over into this, like this, this love affair, this desire to learn and become more involved with beer. I was that one kid in high school that had a, a locker that didn't have like pictures of, um, attractive women or perhaps, uh, sports stars or whatever the case might be. I had cutouts from German magazines of um like a pilsner style beer with the beautiful head like sticking up over the top of the glass because i was enthralled by um you know by what german beer was all about and and was really committed to the idea that my study of german and of german culture was going to carry over into um into learning more about beer and, and you know then I, as i graduated from high school i went on to study german longer i actually went into to college with the uh, intention of studying German and um, spending additional time overseas. And as a, as a sophomore student um, at college, at a college in Ohio, um, I had the opportunity to spend a year in Salzburg, Austria. Wow. And um, in Salzburg, um, one can say that I definitely had a lot of opportunity to become familiarized with uh, uh, Austrian style beers, uh, uh, Hefeweizen styles. And, and in fact, that was the first time that I ever uh, got to travel to Munich to visit the Oktoberfest. Um, Very cool. Homebrewing started really in 1990. Mm -hmm. That was when I first got involved. I, I uh, after I was got back from uh, my time in in Salzburg, um, the following year I took a trip um, to work in Glacier National Park. And while traveling out west uh, with a friend, we stopped in in 
St. Louis. And at our stop in St. Louis, we visited the Anheuser-Busch Brewery. And to date, I had just been a consumer of beer. But at the Anheuser-Busch Brewery, suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, this is how you make this stuff. This is really cool. And I must have spent a lot of the summer kind of talking about how fascinated I was about the, the beer production process that this friend I, I traveled with um, was kind enough to get me a very simple um, book at the time. I don't even know what the title was, but a very simple book um, just about how to get started in home brewing. And, um, you know, from there, came back after that summer in Glacier and was just like fully enthralled with the, the home brewing scene. Uh, started reading d- different home brewing books that were available at the time, like the Charlie Papazian, you know, Complete Joy of Home Brewing. Everything that was out there, um, I got deeply engaged with with home brewing, uh, and really in the mid nineteen nineties. Um, and then I, you mentioned you wrote some articles then, and then eventually, recently, I get well, you took a hiatus, and then I guess recently you transitioned into beer fiction. Is that right? Yeah, um, the you know the the I guess the, the the path to getting there though is is to me what's sort of interesting, right? Because beer fiction um, came from all the different experiences that I was involved with. Mm-hmm. I I worked, um, I had the opportunity to work in a brewery in Munich. I had the opportunity to be uh, uh, an assistant brewer at a place uh, in in Jackson, Wyoming, and worked at, at Snake River Brewing Company for a period of time as a brewer. Um, but what I discovered in the process of all that, because I was as much of a, of a student and a, and a writer and an interested in culture and history, I discovered that, you know, work in the production side of, of a brewery was a little bit um, turning a hobby into a job, right? And, and a lot of people would say, do what you love, turn your hobby into a job. But what I kind of discovered for myself was that turning a, a hobby like homebrewing that I enjoyed so much into a full-time job was a journey that was taking away some of the... Um, the pleasure that I found in just, you know, concocting my own recipes, um, working on the craft of making beer at home and, um, you know, becoming an expert sort of in, in that regard. And so I started to find ways to, um, to write and, and, uh, and ultimately took some of the writing skills that I developed as a student and got involved in, in writing for, for the beer industry, right? So things uh, from about 1995 to about 2005 or 2006, uh, where I wrote for a, a lot of very interesting publications. I mentioned to you um, before we started the conversation that I was uh, frequently wrote for Brew Your Own magazine, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, are very familiar with Brew Your Own magazine. Yep. Uh, you know, it's, it's just such a great publication for home brewers and uh, so filled with information. And I was certainly proud looking back on it and proud even to this day. Um, to have been a, a regular contributor, I, I wrote a lot of the uh, tips from the pros columns um, that you would find both in the Brew Your Own magazine now as well as in your winemaking magazine. Um, I wrote for an industry magazine uh, for the for the brewing industry back in the day called uh, Brew Pub. Um, it, I think it folded in something like 1998, uh, maybe 1999, but that was specific to the uh, to the uh, to the brew pub industry. Um, back in the late 1990s. And so, you know, like all that different writing ultimately be, um, brought me over to this, had to take time off. I needed to focus on uh, career and family, kids, um, all that kind of thing. So I took off a bunch of years and um, and used that opportunity, not just to focus on all the things I just mentioned, but to think really about um, what would be an interesting sort of future endeavor around my love for beer and the things that I had sort of done previously in my life and uh, travel, culture, history, and beer are all um, without a doubt woven together in my experience in such a fashion that uh, the, the, the fiction that I am now um, developing uh, with the first novel now being an Oktoberfest death is, is intended to bring all of that, that sort of story together, a part of my, my life, a part of my experience, part of my perspective, um, but then also share that and the, the changes and the excitement around the beer world. And especially now the, the American craft beer scene will be um, what will play out in, in subsequent novels in this series. Well, I want to um, I want to dive into the novel at the end, but before we do that, you, you mentioned today you wanted to talk about a couple beer styles and uh, I'm sure you're going to get into some of the history and the uh, culture that goes around the beer styles. 
as we discuss them. And then I'm hoping we can we can wrap that up at the end and, and talk a little more about your book. But um, let's start with the first one, which was Oktoberfest. Um, you mentioned you went to the Oktoberfest in Munich. Obviously, mm-hmm. the fest style is very, very popular, uh, really worldwide. Um, you know, what's some of the history behind that particular beer style and, and how has it evolved over the years? Yeah, it's, you know, I think it's important first to, to realize, um, to kind of contextually think for a second that the Oktoberfest itself is more than 200 years old. Like it's easy to kind of sit here today and, and just here we are in our present, you know, 2021, we just had the, you know, first time in recent history where the Oktoberfest itself in Munich was canceled. Um, and with all the impacts of COVID to just forget a little bit, the, the long history of the Oktoberfest and it, it truly dates back to the early 1800s. In fact, 1810 was uh, the genesis, so to speak of, of the Munich Oktoberfest. And it wasn't a, a beer festival as we understand it today. Instead, it was a marriage ceremony. Um, there was uh, the intended marriage of uh, uh, Crown Prince Ludwig to uh, Princess Teresa, and it was scheduled to occur um, in mid-October. I think it was October 12th. And um, the actual event itself was um, going to be a horse race. This was a situation where a few of the uh, Bavarian officers uh, uh, petitioned or convinced the king uh, of Bavaria at the time, King Maximilian, to cap off the wedding ceremony with a horse race Mm -hmm. at a basically at a meadow um, outside of the gates of Munich, right? It's like we see Munich as it is today as a major city, but Munich, you know, back in the early 1800s was completely different than we can even imagine it now. Um, and so kind of convinced uh, the king to, to put on this horse race and it was wildly successful, right? And, and so with all that success, um, of course, came the desire to repeat it and turn it into um, uh, you know, an annualized event. And so, uh, you know, in, in, in years that followed, things would occur with like agricultural um, uh, uh, wares being brought to the event, you know, from around uh, all of Bavaria and perhaps other, um, you know, like trapeze artists or, or things like that were brought to the, to the Oktoberfest in order to expand the, the event. Um, and, you know, but what ended up occurring though, is that in the, in the, field outside of the old Munich, this, this meadow is called Theresienwiese, or, or in today's words, they just call it the Diesen, but the, the Ther- Theresa's meadow is where they originally ran those horse races. And that meadow, uh, the Diesen, has been since turned into the place where the, the Oktoberfest is, um, is uh, um, enjoyed on an annual basis. And only a few times in history, really, through wars and COVID in this instance has the Oktoberfest ever been uh, canceled. So for the most part, it has gone on annually since 1810. Mm. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important to also, when we talk about just the, the time, when you go back in time to 1810, to think a little bit about how different the Oktoberfest would have been or would have felt for people that visited the Oktoberfest um, then, than what we what we know today, right? We, we fly across the ocean if if flights were available to us, uh, traveling by train or by car if we were from outside of Munich. But for those, you know, in the early stages, in the early, um, you know, say first hundred years or so of the Oktoberfest, they traveled in by foot, maybe by wagon or horse. Um, but for the most part, um, getting to to Munich and getting to the Oktoberfest, unless maybe you lived within the city proper, was a challenge, right? It was part of like physically challenging to get there and so um you know as part of that being challenging um the the idea within oktoberfest literature and one of the first things that i ever sort of studied and actually wrote about and published about was the changing concept of thirst durst in german uh as it as it plays off uh, plays through in in literature um uh, specific to the oktoberfest one of the first, actually, the very first thing that I ever published was in a, a, a Bavarian literary magazine uh, called Literatur in Bayern. And it was about uh, the beer at the Oktoberfest uh, and how the, the meaning behind the word thirst 
had changed in Oktoberfest literature over the last, you know, like roughly 180 years or so, whenever it was that I had actually written that article. So there's like a lot of history uh, conceptually behind the, the, the event uh, that then ties into the beer, right? So, um, so that, you know, we, we, we really want to think about all those different contexts when we talk about the, the style and the way that the style has changed. Well, can, um, you, can you talk that, about that, about the specific sure. style that, 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 like you said, has evolved over time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the original style, maybe a little bit hard to pinpoint when you go back to 1810, right? Because some of the, the really not some, but the production methods and the production capabilities in the early 1800s were nothing like what would come up as uh, uh, industrialization occurred throughout Europe and throughout the greater West. Um, but the, the idea in Germany of calling beer flüssiges Brot or, or liquid bread um, is a concept that, that speaks to the German mindset of beer being a staple food. And one of the reasons that beer is, is considered a staple food uh, in Germany is because of the long tradition um, and also the type of beer that um, was brewed historically within, within Germany, right? Like it date backs over a long timeline where, um, whereby uh, the beer used to be typically a darker beer, a heavier beer, a more robust style of beer and the um the original style of the oktoberfest like i said can't necessarily be pinpointed at the time of 1810 but we can kind of like i think get a pretty good idea of what the beer was like based upon uh the tendencies at the time to make these darker more robust beers but mm -hmm. but by the 1850s um there there began to be a greater understanding a greater um perception of how yeast plays a role in the fermentation process. And so in, in major brewing centers throughout uh, Europe, particularly in Vienna and in Munich, breweries were starting to try to figure out how to overcome the uh, negative implications of, from a flavor perspective, the negative implications of what warm uh, summer weather uh, would do to the beers that they were producing. And so uh, a, a, one of the tricks um, that the, the smart brewers at the time figured out was that by brewing in in the, the cooler seasons and specifically brewing in March and then um, utilizing caves and cool areas uh, in order to keep the beer safe during the warmer months uh, resulted in a, a more flavorful, more delicious, predictable beer come the fall. Mm -hmm. And so in German, uh, March is Merz. And so Merzen means March beer, basically. And so beers that were produced in March became Meritzen and then became beers that were, um, that were going to be, you know, rolled out more towards the fall. Um, there's some, um, you know, evidence based on, uh, based on research and, and whatnot that uh, Spaten Brewery in, in Munich, uh, one of the remaining larger breweries today, the Spaten um, was the first Munich brewery to introduce um, a version of the modern merits and beer, like roughly um, in the early 1840s, um, I believe is when uh, they think that that was originally introduced. And then um, later, a couple decades, several decades later, in the early 1870s, um, part of the Spaten Brewery lineage, so not Spaten itself, but one of the, the breweries within the, 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 what ultimately became Spaten Brewery uh, through a relative of, of the Spaten uh, owner at the time, they introduced the very first, um, uh, what was considered the first Oktoberfest merits in about the early 1870s. Um, and that really became the style that, that ruled the Oktoberfest for the next 100 years. It tends to be more of a, of a amber to copper red colored beer. Mm -hmm. um, it's not pale. We'll talk about fest beer in a second, but a, but a traditional Meritzen tends to be more of a, of a, of a dark, darker colored beer. Um, has a nice, rich, bready, aromatic component to it. Um, uh, like kind of a creamy, smooth mouth feel with like a, a hint of carbonation, um, you know, a proper, like moderate carbonation without being overly spritzy on the tongue. Um, and, you know, if you go back to that concept that I mentioned of flüssiges Brot, uh, liquid bread, that's, I think, a good like flavor concept to, to throw at a traditional Meritzen, right? Like a, 
mm-hmm. toasty bread like characteristic. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about how you can brew brew one of these beers. What <laughs> starting with the the grain bill? Can you go ahead and walk us through uh, you know so what what a typical recipe might look like uh, and what some of the processes involved are? Sure. Um, so. You know, a Fest beer and a Meritzen are two distinctly different types of beers, right? A a Meritzen is going to be, like I said, the the darker colored um, style of a traditional Oktoberfest. The Fest beer um, is the the style of Oktoberfest that you find um, if you visited the Oktoberfest today. That's really what you'd find um, being served in the tent. It's it's, kind of like a Hellas style beer on steroids. It's a little, um, a little lighter, if I recall, right? Yeah, far lighter in color. It's going to be really, um, like a, talk about a Hellas here, I think, in a moment. But it's, it's, uh, um, it, it took over uh, as the beer of choice at the Oktoberfest, um, really starting in about the 1970s. There's some, mm-hmm. some history that indicates that maybe in the, in the early to mid-1950s, um, Augustiner Broy uh, introduced the Edelstoff, and the Edelstoff um, uh, was sort of like the first move towards a stronger, light-colored beer um, that then became, its, in a sense, a precursor for the for the uh, Oktoberfest uh, fest beer style that we know today. Um, but when, so when I like to make an Oktoberfest, though, um, you know what I what I try to do in my home brewing is really fall to the to the Meritzen style um, for. For a variety of reasons, one from a historical perspective, I find it to be um, interesting and enjoyable, and maybe a little bit more challenging. But but uh, I like the robustness of the flavor um, mm-hmm. and and trying to to pull in uh, the various characteristics that I mentioned here just a moment ago. So um, so what I you know what I tend to think towards is the fact that Vienna malt. Um, can really be used as the primary base malt when I'm brewing an Oktoberfest beer and then supplement that with, um, with a smaller amount of of Pilsner malt and then a portion of Munich malt in order to sort of round out that sort of bready or characteristic that I'm shooting for in the, in the final style. My most recent version is I looked at the percentages of the malt bill just to kind of discuss that here today. I, you know, what I've specifically did was 57% Vienna malt, um, 29% Munich malt and um, 14% uh, of a, is actually I used the Bohemian, a floor malted Bohemian Pilsner. I've been experimenting with a, a floor malted Bohemian Pilsner in my different uh, German style beers over the last year. And so that was, uh, that was what I, uh, that was kind of what I did as far as the, the overall grain bill, again, mm-hmm. shooting for a, a, that darker characteristic, but trying to get that kind of, uh, that bready, that liquid bready type of, of component to it without making a beer that was too heavy. Um, you know, I sort of shot towards um, uh, like a five, eight percent alcohol volume target is what I was shooting for with that. So I didn't want something that was going to like knock you out, but I wanted something that was appropriate to, you know, Oktoberfest Wiesen style strength. Um, I think here in the States, we tend to want uh higher alcohol content beers, but at the, at the actual Oktoberfest itself, um, you if you find something over 6%, I'd be pretty surprised. Yeah. It's interesting. You're using so much Vienna malt too. I know uh, it's probably a little bit more traditional to use uh, uh, Munich malt, right? As a base. Well, well, um, so, but so Vienna malt actually has more of the diastatic power, has more of a conversion capability and it, pr- pr- as opposed to Munich malt, which, um, so from my perspective, uh, it needs a little bit extra boost in order to get you over the top from a conversion perspective mm-hmm. and get you the fermentable sugars that you need, right? And so Vienna malt plays a strong base. Um, again, if you remember some of the, the attributes of the history of how Meritzen was part of like the, the Viennese as well as the Munich uh, brewing history, um, trying to blend those concepts together mm-hmm. to create uh, you know, an, an interesting overlap of the way that those malts can play together again, like basically replacing, um, replacing Pilsner malt with Vienna malt because of their ability, its ability to serve as a base malt itself, but give more, uh, of the bready characteristics that you would be searching for, um, in the Munich malt. And what kind of hop and mash schedule do you use? Do you have a preferred yeast style? 
Yeah, I am. Um, I think by default, because of the fact that I made the decision a few years ago to start growing hollow tower hops on the side of my house, when it comes to making um, German style beers, I'm pretty much wedded to um, hollow tower hops. But that doesn't mean that I always use the the homegrown hops in my beer because it's a little bit difficult sometimes, if not impossible, to know precisely um, what sort of uh, AUs I'm going to get out of that hop. So I might tend, as I did in my Oktoberfest this year, um, to use a, more of a pelletized hop um, and more of a predictable outcome um, with regards to that. So I use I use um, hollow tower hops. I would I would no doubt I would always stand by um, using a, a German style noble hop for any Oktoberfest or any German style beer really that I was going to make. I wouldn't I wouldn't vary from that just out of a sense of, of being a little bit of a, of a purist in that regards. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, what was your next question? Well, it's a mash schedule, I guess. Uh, do you do anything special in the mash, for example? Yeah. So, um, just thinking here for a second, um, how do I do my mash? I, uh, you know, I, I tend to mash in at a, at a, at a bit of a lower temperature and, um, and work my mash up. So through the system that I utilize, um, and actually I'm one of these electric brewer people here lately testing out an electric brew system over the last year to see, um, if I like the results, um, I tend to mash in, um, close to like a 135 temperature. That's like my target temperature and then utilize the, uh, the, the system itself. The fact that it has a, a electric element to slowly raise through these rests towards mash out at 170. So like I'll mash in and target a temperature about 135, um, trying my, my, my best to, you know, bring in the beta amylase to the, to the, to the start of the mash process. And then, and then as I elevate the temperature and then I have a recirculation pump that allows the temperature to, uh, to just gradually elevate through the reheating that I'm working through all of these different rests without having like a sudden shock by adding just a, a, a bunch of hot water sure. or by doing some sort of a decoction. Right. And how, and I, how, and, how high do you go? How high uh, do you need to stop? I'm sorry. How high temperature? How, yeah. How high temperature do you stop? I mean, you're going to, you're going to ramp it up uh, over time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I'll, I'll let it, I'll let it rest at about at 135 for about 10 minutes and I'll start moving it up to about 145 and let it rest there for 30 minutes. Um, and then I'll ramp it up to about 156 or so, and then um, and let it rest there. Again, it's moving through all the different temperature gradations during the process, and then I'll 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 mash out out of 170. And the system with the recirculation, it, it works quite smoothly. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, how? Um, what about your yeast? Do you have a preferred yeast, and and how do you ferment out and finish the beer? Yeah, the the my feeling on the Oktoberfest is that. Again, it needs to be a traditional Bavarian style yeast. Um, what I did this particular year was um, the Imperial, uh, the L13 um, Global, um, which I, my understanding, that's the, the Weinstefan yeast. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of the things that I, I also thought was really important for the beer, I'm trying my best to avoid any sort of like off flavor, unexpected fruitiness because of temperature shock and the like was a most importantly, I'm sure your listeners all know this, get your temperature down immediately, right? You, you, you boil hard, you chill fast, right? So you, you got to get that, that, that down to pitching temperature as quickly as you can. The system that I'm using now as a, as a, an immersion chiller, I'm not the hugest fan of that. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that it's easier to clean um, and uh, that it, it, it does provide, again, through the electric system, I'm able to monitor the declining temperature pretty closely and get it to shut off where I need to. In this instance, um, I shut it off at, when I hit 55 degrees and, um, and then basically whirlpooled it really quickly within the, within the, um, uh, the, the electric system, the mash tun system that has the all-in-one, basically, if you want to call it that. And um, let it rest for about 15 minutes to create a whirlpool. And then I transfer it over at 55 and, and actually use two packets of the, um, that imperial uh, global yeast that I mentioned um, to, to help 
get fermentation started um, quickly and efficiently without the risk of, of putting stress on that yeast. But at the same time, um, I, I have a, I have one, I'm sure again, many of your listeners have one of these um, uh, repurposed chest freezers with an external thermostat. Um, I got the, the fermenter uh, into that uh, freezer at a 48 degree temperature setting immediately so that um, while the yeast was ramping up, the temperature was going down. And so in the process of that, I got it set down to 48 degrees. So by the time really we were at, you know, full croise and we were talking about a, a temperature of about 48 degrees inside the vessel. And I think holding, you know, having that temperature and, and holding a cold temperature is of, of anything that you can do making uh, a lager style, Oktoberfest or Hellas, um, getting the temperature, the, the fermentation temperature right, that, that is the, if nothing else for home brewers, that is the key to a good beer. And a related style you want to discuss was Hellas. Um, yep. And we probably can't go into quite as much detail because of time, but, but can you talk a little bit about Hellas and how it came together? Yeah. Um, well, I, I mentioned briefly the, the fest beer as, as a, as a style. Cause that's like similar to the Oktoberfest in terms of, you know, people like to drink the Oktoberfest, but the Hellas itself, um, you know, if you look in the, uh, uh, the, the guidelines, the BJCP guidelines, um, what you find under the pale malty European lagers are um, the, the Helles Bach, the Fest beer, and the Helles, right? And so the, and it's sort of in reverse order, the Helles being the, the, the lightest, so to speak, the weakest from an alcohol content of mm -hmm. the different pale uh, malty European lagers that you can get. Um, you know, again, if you go way back in time, um, to the late 1800s, the Czech brewers, uh, they were coming up with some pretty popular beers. The, the, the Czech, um, the, excuse me while I hit this phone here. Uh, sorry about that. The, uh, the, the, the Czech uh, brewers were coming up with Czech Pilsner styles, and, mm -hmm. and those were proven to be very popular. And, um, and so Munich brewers, again, more traditionally, um, having been making darker beers, more robust beers, um, also realized or recognized that uh, brewing's a business, right? They, they needed to compete against um, what was showing itself to be a very popular style. And so um, so they started developing this, this Helles, as it's called, right? So Hell in German basically means pale in English. And so a Helles beer is a, is a pale lager. It's, it's designed to be, you know, golden in color, um, you know, yellow to golden in color. Is it tied at all to the to the Oktoberfest, or is it a completely separate style? It's a it's a separate style. It's not really. It's it's really more um, from my perspective. It's it is a it is a competitive um, uh, tack, so to speak, of the German breweries around the time of the Czech uh, Pilsner um, in order to remain um, popular, and competitive in in that space during the time that the Czech Pilsner was was. And did, did, did it originate in Munich or, or, or somewhere else in Germany? I can't recall. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the Munich Hellas, okay. um, known for being um, you know, really originating in, in the Munich area. Yep. Well, tell, yeah, us a, uh, tell us about brewing a, a Hellas, uh, starting with a grain bill again. Well, so, you know, similar to, <laughs> similar to what we talked about with the Oktoberfest, just to kind of like think a little bit about um, – the, the percentages that I put into these beers, I'm trying to find it sure. here for one second. Um, you know, it's like what I try to do um, is is test out different like potential um, potential recipes to see uh, like what I think is going to work out best. And so, like what I've tried um, in brewing this this beer is continuing to, to dabble in the idea of uh, using this floor malted Bohemian Pilsner mm -hmm. um, and then also tying in Vienna malt to to push into the Hellas style a little bit more grainy characteristic than um, than perhaps people might might tend to um, expect just in some of the experiences that they've had um, uh, drinking um, you know beer that they've imported 
um, out of Germany um, that's been maybe on the water for a little too long. It's not quite as fresh as it could be, or even maybe trying some um, uh, craft beer styles that are brewed here in the States. But but I, I had the, the experience, as I mentioned, working in a German brewery in Munich for a period of time um, that was, uh, you know, like kind of um, set a deep impression in my memory as far as the, the way that a beer as fresh as could possibly be, whether it be bottled or coming from the, the kegs that we sometimes had the opportunity to sample from, um, that it set into my mind this, this desire to try to find that taste profile. Um, and, I, and I feel like this blend of, 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 of a Pilsner uh, grain bill tied in with a Vienna malt to add a little bit more bready characteristic to it is on the right path to achieving that. And so I keep dabbling um, in different recipe profiles. And then so my more recent uh, recipes, what I've, what I've tried are, are different variations of, of trying to find that. And so um, most recently I made some uh, the batches where I did 80% Pilsner malt um, against 20% Vienna malt. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a 73 to 27% blend again with 27% being Vienna malt and then uh, 64% to 36%. Um, I'm still a little bit up in the air on where I'm landing as, as it pertains to that. But again, understanding that, that the, the, the ability to convert those grains, the full conversion capabilities of both the Pilsner malt as well as the, the Vienna malt is intended to, um, to, to uh, deepen the complexity of the Hellas from a grain perspective, um, with with a uh, you know with a while keeping it sort of on that sort of multi um, sweet profile that we're sort of shooting for as it pertains to that style. And what about the uh, the rest of the bill? Are you still using uh, the traditional German hops and uh, uh, same type of yeast? Yeah, I so. Again, I'm going to be honest and, and just say that being the, the purest that I am and the fact that I grow the uh, the hollow tower on the side of the house here, um, I will use hollow tower hops in the Hellas as a bittering hop. Mm-hmm. Um, but the style does allow for um, does allow for a little bit of hop flavor and aroma. And in fact, that's one of one of the characteristics from my time working in the, the brewery in Munich that I remember so distinctly well opening um, fresh bottles of the uh, of the Hellas that was brewed there um, and you know working with the brewers they pop it open and you know, kind of they always let the, the beers warm a little bit too right it was never like you took it where it was ice cold or or, or even near uh, 35 degrees or whatever it'd be soak it in a, in a bottle of warm water for a period of time if you needed to in order to let that sort of like uh, fresh malty as well as hop characteristics open up and when you pop it open mm-hmm. um just kind of waft it under your nose that hint of, of of hops on the tail end of that aroma was just there it's kind of like a little um hint of of what was to come and it was like this uh really uh, sort of like magical moment that's that's stuck in my memory and that i'm trying hard to replicate and so for my um from as a, when i'm brewing the hellas that's where i use my homegrown um leaf hops is uh, on the tail end of the boil. Like typically what I'll do is I'll, as I mentioned before with the Oktoberfest and creating the whirlpool um, is in during that whirlpool process, um, I will actually shut down the um, the chilling for just a little bit of time or right, try to hit it right around 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it seems to be a good temperature um, to extract the aromatic components and some of the flavor components of the hops over about a 10, 10 minute period of time. And then I will crank up the, the, the chilling process again. And, you know, typically I'm using like one of those muslin bags with the hops inside of it. Otherwise it gums everything up. So, you know, kind of keep it in there, mix it around a little bit as needed, but uh, um, really that's where I'm trying to find the tail end of, of a little bit of hop characteristic to, to bring that little extra special something to my Hella style. And so, do you think? Uh, do you use the same yeast and finishing techniques you did for the uh, for the Munich Oktoberfest beer? The the uh, um, yeast that I used have used for the Hellas um, are both uh, are both imperial style yeasts. Um, mm-hmm. I've tried both the uh, the L thirteen the the imperial uh, global as well as the L seventeen the uh, the imperial harvest. 
the harvest supposedly comes from the Augustina Brewery. Um, the, uh, the the global, as I mentioned before, supposedly the Vian Stefan. Um, I'm a little up in the air on both of them. I'm going to actually do a side by side brew here one of these days and mm-hmm. and use the yeast in both of those with probably the same um, grain bill. Uh, everything is close to this being the same as possible, and and try to come to a better conclusion as to which I like better for um, for my uh, for my Hellas yeast. The one thing that I would say, um, no, we're going to jump off here. To another topic in a second is that as it pertains to a hellas more important than anything is a aggressive boil you got to boil it away you got to boil the dms away so um boil fast again even more so than i would say than the october fest boil boil hard and then chill fast and that'll help reduce some of the potential off flavors that could come with a, a, a beer of such light quality yeah, I mean, be, being a light lager, almost any flaw is going to show up pretty big in 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 these beers. So obviously, you got to be really careful all the way through the process, right? That, that, absolutely, and I'll tell you, in my opinion, there's no better sign of uh, brewing ability than to be able to brew a light lager well. So um, I consider it a challenge that I'm always willing to face, and it's it's a lot of fun. Well, uh, we're coming up to the end of the time, and I wanted to give you a couple minutes to talk about your uh, fiction book uh, on Oktoberfest death that you published just a short time ago. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So, an Oktoberfest death. It's my first uh, run at fiction, uh, published at the end of September, early October. Um, it is intended to be the first book in a series um, that that follows the adventures of my my main character. Uh, her name is Bethany judge bethany r judge to be specific she's a retired police officer and uh she decides to become a beer expert a a certified master cicerone and um start like on her first big adventure so to speak to travel over to munich and learn uh uh, firsthand about bavarian beers specifically the oktoberfest but um she drinks plenty of helles hefeweizen and dunkles along the way um you know and of course then she finds herself in t- in, a, in a bunch of different situations uh, uh where murder is involved and um and she tries to get herself out of out of a sticky situation it gives me an opportunity writing that novel to um to really touch upon things that i've experienced in 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 truly like experience in my real life and you can kind of pick up some of those things uh in the novel as you read it there's a mention of being at the Oktoberfest and there's a, an old gentleman with his lederhosen flap um, hanging open and he's urinating in the middle of the crowd. Well, I saw that happen in real life. Oh, I've um, seen that happen too there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like some of the funny things that you get to experience, you know, and uh, the book opens with um, Bethany using the train um, as a place to sleep um, as opposed to getting a hotel and a, a little bit of, of, uh, taken liberties on that one but i did the same thing when i lived in salzburg but right? to travel back to salzburg instead of um getting a hotel in munich i took the the train from munich back to salzburg and just slept it off during that trip and a whole lot of you know other little pieces like that that are tied into the story that are based upon um experience and then culture and history um you know that get that get really like wrapped into um what i hope the reader will find to be an exciting story um there People may not know that the original uh, uh, sort of rise of the Nazi party in Germany um, started sort of semi-officially in 1923 when uh, Adolf Hitler tried to overthrow the Bavarian government. That was called the uh, the, the uh, Beer Hall Putsch, it was a coup d'etat effort. That I was recall ultimately- reading about it in history, yeah. Yeah, so it ultimately failed. And um, there's a there's a brief comment, um, sort of like a, a, there's a part to the story where there's a letter that's being read that sort of ties back to that beer hall putsch, right? So, mm. so all the experiences, all the, the um, sort of knowledge and things that I kind of picked up along the way that are, um, are kind of tied in in a variety of different ways throughout the story. And then, you know, what will ultimately happen then is, uh, you know, I'm working on this, the second book in the series. And, um, and really, as the series continues, the arc brings us from Munich to the United States and what's going to happen now will all take place within the American craft brewing world. Cool. Um, well, Thomas, uh, where can people find the book? So um, it's, it's published under my full pen name, which is Thomas J Miller, J is in John. So Thomas J Miller. Um, it's available on my 
author website, which is thomasjmillerauthor.com. If you order from my uh, from my website, I will sign that copy and send it out to you. Um, if you're interested in ordering from other online platforms, it's certainly available on Amazon, and it's available on Barnes and Noble. Um, it can be ordered on Amazon also on uh, as a Kindle version as well. So there are electronic versions out there. If there's anybody listening who's a librarian or works in a bookstore, um, it is also available on the major wholesaler websites like uh, Baker and Taylor and Ingram. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's published under the title An Oktoberfest Death. Uh, and Oktoberfest is spelled O-K, O-K-T-O-B-E-R, Fest, all one word, um, under my name, Thomas J. Miller. Well, Thomas, uh, uh, thank you very, very much for coming on the show. It's been great having you. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Hope to do it again. And my guest today was Thomas Miller. Uh, Thomas has written a number of articles on brewing and the craft beer industry. Uh, and he recently published his first novel on Oktoberfest death. Thanks again, Thomas. Thank you. A big thank you to Thomas Miller for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're offering access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, oil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order, your today, order yours today, go to blickmanengineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith Brewing Software a try. If you've not downloaded the new 3.1 update, grab it now as it includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, new add-ons, and much more. To download a free 21-day trial, go to Beersmith.com today. Again, that's Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.